days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light away, Lord, you light away. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. You alive today because Jesus is alive. We give you praise this morning. You have the most powerful force in the universe, in all the universes, on your side. You can rest in his great love for you, knowing that he's going to take care of you. He's going to protect you and see you through every mountain and every valley. We have a great service for you here today. We're excited to continue to pour out these praises to the one who was and is and is yet to come. Over the mountains and the seas, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart. And let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. Over the mountains. 
mountains and the sea. Your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I can sing of your love. God's promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, right? Which means every promise is guaranteed. What are his promises? He promises always to be with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He will protect us. He is always in control. He's always good and is always watching. He is always victorious and he will never fail. He will always love us. That's so important. He will always love us. No matter what we did this week, how we messed up, it doesn't matter. He loves you. He loves us. This week, I read this in James. It says this, every good and perfect gift is from God. What I saw there was actually a warning, and I'll explain it to you. So I was Thursday years old when I heard this phrase and finally understood what it means. The phrase is, the devil wears Prada right? In other words, bad things can look to be good, but are counterfeit blessings, right? So when we're willing to compromise, we get a compromised result. Beloved, God doesn't want you to accept a counterfeit blessing. He wants what is best for you. He wants you to have the real thing. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your promises that are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And we know that you are faithful who has promised. Help us not to accept those counterfeit blessings that only look good but are not your way. Give us discernment to spot the fakes, my God. Give us wisdom in testing everything against your word. Thank you that you would never compromise. You didn't go halfway to the cross and change your mind. You went all the way. We want that resolve, that same resolve, God, to follow Jesus. Don't let us give in to our moments of weakness, which we all have. 
And it is in his beautiful name that we have prayed. Jesus, amen. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you, you, you are my king. You are my king. And I'm seeing that a lot of people are concerned with dying with COVID. It's more important that we understand dying without Jesus is worse than dying with COVID. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, all of that power, whoo, all of the glory forever and ever and ever and ever in eternal life. And all the saints said, amen. amen. Be blessed. boys and girls. I hope all of you are doing really well this morning. I just want to talk first about a few things. Remember that if you guys are interested in having one of these craft bags, please let me know. Parents, they're here ready to go. All you have to do is just let me know that you're interested and I will come by and drop it off to you. Those of you who are out there and perhaps you're new to us, the same. You do not have to be a member of our church to get a visit from me, to get one of these craft kits for your kids, I would love to come by and drop one of these off. 
also, today at noon, I'm going to be hosting a Sunday School Talk Zoom. So I've sent emails out with your invitation. So please log on. And I can't wait to see you guys together at noon, okay? Well, now, I know that most of you know what this is, right? It's a nightlight, right? Now, some of our parents will put this in our rooms so that you're not so afraid of the dark. Now, how many of you guys are afraid of the dark? I know I am. You know, when I was a young girl, one of my chores was to take the garbage out every day. And I would put it off and put it off. And you know what would happen is that it would get dark. And I would have to take that garbage out. And I got to tell you something. When I heard a noise, oh, my gosh, I would turn around and run back home. I swear I think sometimes I set world speed records for running back to the front door. <laughs> Now, have you guys been afraid of a thunderstorm at night? And I guess some of you, right, would probably run over to your mom and dad's room and kind of crawl into bed with them. Well, don't worry, because I think all of us have done that one time or another. Now, sometimes, boys and girls, there are storms in our lives, and we become afraid. We don't know what's ahead of us. We don't know what's behind us. And things are uncertain, and that makes us afraid. But when we're afraid, guess what? We have a light, and that light is called Jesus. Now, in our Bible, it tells us that God is light, and in him, in him, there is no darkness. Amen. Now, another thing the Bible tells us is that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? So, in the dark and stormy days of our life, we have Jesus to be with us, boys and girls. And when Jesus is with us, you don't have to be afraid. Amen? Amen. Hands up. Hands together. Hands up. <laughs> Hands together. Dear Lord, help us to remember that when the dark and stormy nights come in our life, that you are there. We have no need, but no need to be afraid. In his name, boys and girls, we all said in one big voice, let me hear you. Amen. Guys, see you at noon. Bye. Well, hello, Miss Rachel. Welcome home. I know you had a great vacation. I got to tell you, Miss Glory's story about the being afraid to go into the garbage, I got one on her that would make you shudder to think. You know, I grew up in Minnesota in the country, right? And so not only did we have to empty the garbage, but I'd have to take it like a quarter of a mile through the dark, dark night. And it was cold, and the, and the stars were all, and there was really bears. So I don't know what she's complaining about, because all she had to do was some city stuff, but I had some real figure too. But thank God I had Jesus in my life back then. You know, Amen. part of being a, with a family is that you have to contribute, though. So regardless of whether I wanted to do that or not, or I felt comfortable or not, or not I had to contribute something to the family. I had to give something back. And one thing about offering that I know is an opportunity to people to just get connected to the church. And I know you know we got some things that are changing around here, right? Due to this COVID-19 business, we're going to have to make a major change to what happens this fall. What, what's going to happen? Do you know? I know, but I'm afraid to say it. You say it. No pumpkin patch. How about that for simple? There's no pumpkin patch. But, but, you know, it's inspiration time because we can't really do the pumpkin patch the way we plan on normally doing it. So we're going to come up with some different ways that we're going to reach out into the community and be honest with you, we've got to do some fundraisers. That's a big chunk out of, our, uh, out of our offering, out of our tithing that has to be made up uh, from what the pumpkin patch normally brought in. But, you know, I know that's God is working in this church. Because I said, I've been saying for the well, last four or five, six years that, you know, we just have to wean ourselves from the funds of the pumpkin patch. And we've got to get to the point where the church is taking care of the church's business. And guess what? God has answered 
my prayers. <laughs> I'm not Here sure, we go. <laughs> not sure that I'm glad he did, but, uh, but you know what? Sometimes we get to do things that are uncomfortable. Sometimes we've got to step out into the wilderness, into the woods, and go to places we don't want to go. And here we are, one of those places. But as Miss Gloria said, we have Jesus. We have the light of Christ to guide us through this crisis or, or this opportunity, depending on how you look at it. I love to look at opportunities as being some of the crises other people have. When the door is shut, there is going to be something phenomenal opened up. But believe you me, we are going to have to dig in deep to make some things happen. You said we're going to have to have a car wash every single day, right? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> I don't know. I we're don't know getting super not. creative. You guys are, are going to see some things that we haven't done before. And I'm excited. This pumpkin patch group, this uh, committee that's formed, they have so many excellent ideas. Yes, they and they are so committed to your church. And I am so excited for what's coming. I am too. But you know what? Uh, why don't you get us in the right frame of mind to, to push that button that says give? Because never before in the history of my being here, in the history of the church in my time, have we needed that giving to happen right now. And so God bless you guys for giving all that you do. And we need to think about doing a little bit more. Instead of that meal out that you're not getting anyway because you can't go to restaurants, that's the kind of thing that we're going to need donations with. Those little things that you can do right now today. Hit the give button. Do whatever you can because uh, we're going to do wonderful things this year. I mean, we've done some wonderful things and more are coming. You know, we actually have that COVID tested site going here at the church. And can I share one little quick story with you? Uh, I know that uh, not everybody's comfortable. Heck, I'm not comfortable being around a COVID testing site. Let's be honest. It's not something I'm looking forward to. But when God speaks to us, and he did to me, he said, you know what? I, I told you to be a church that's a mission-oriented church. And when somebody calls and said, can we do a mission at your church? The only, there's only one answer. Yes. And so even though we're in our uncomfortable zone, I will watch how God worked in this. And, and a member of our church and her family uh, was really alarmed that their daughter had COVID-19. And they came, and within 15 minutes of their appointment, they realized that they were COVID-free. And the burden that was lifted from them because of the ministry that we're doing here this week, an uncomfortable one, an unpleasant one for a lot of people, uh, it's doing what God calls us to do. You know, we're a place where lepers are welcome. We're a place where the humble come. We're a place where God's lifted up and prays every single week. So I'm just thankful that you're going to share a wonderful song for us and that uh, we're going to feel like giving more and more as this year unfolds. God bless you and thank you for that. So this week at Bible study, we were talking about the sinful woman who was at Jesus' feet anointing him. You know, she was crying. She was overwhelmed with love for her Savior. She had found forgiveness. She had found love. And this is what God offers us every single day through Jesus. And this song is from her perspective. I went to the place he was dining to pour my life on my love. I wrapped my hair around him and the fragrance drifted up. I didn't even notice when they began to judge. His love is out of this world and I'm totally He's alive, he's alive, and I've only just begun to worship him. He's alive, and I've only just begun to worship him. I went to the place where they laid him to look upon his face. Angels and garments place. I asked them where my love has gone. Have you hidden him from me? Cause I've so much more to give to the one who set me free. They said he's alive, he's alive, and you've only just begun to worship him. He's alive, and you've only just begun to worship him. I go to the places he lingers and I follow him with my song. I feel his breath on my fingers as I lift him up. I know this is just 
was the beginning of this wonderful wave Riding on a ribbon of never-ending praise He's alive, he's alive And we've only just begun to worship him He's alive, and we've only just begun to worship him We've talked about all the different things that have been happening in our lives and, and uh, talked about conflict. We've talked about what's going on with Abraham. And, and I've learned some lessons along the way. And uh, there's some lessons I've been learning this year as well. There's some lessons in life that I didn't think I would have to learn and have been forced to learn. And one of those is to be patient. I'm not a patient person. But, you know, 2020 has been a year that has tested my patience and I've grown from it. And I actually, I wasn't really expecting that to happen. I, I had no desire to let that happen, actually. And i got to tell you, um, Miss Gloria, do me a favor and grab this week's sermon and not last week's sermon because it's going to read a lot better <laughs> if I take the one that's actually on tap for today. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I don't know. This is a crazy world I live in, right? Uh, anyway, yeah, so I've been, I've been going through some trials and trying to get a, ha- get a handle on what's happening with this, this idea of discipline. And I've learned. You know, now this whole book that we've been looking at in Genesis, and the story about Abraham, has offered us some life lessons, some things that we need to grasp a hold of because it's actually going to make a difference in our lives. I mean, not, maybe not today, or maybe it is something that you're struggling with right now, but it's also preparing us for things that might happen in advance. And today is no exception. The lesson we're going to look at today that comes from the book of Abraham is going to make a difference. Now, it's a foundational lesson that God is offering us, and I hope you're ready to hear it. It's coming from God's Word, of course, so to prepare our hearts and minds for this lesson, won't you join me, please, in in, uh, reciting our Bible commitment statement. It starts with the words, this is, this is, what? God's Word. This is God's Word given to help me know and love God, and I will read it and live by the teaching Jesus gave us and use it to change lives and build community for Christ, exactly what we are doing today in this church. Let me read from Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. After this, the word of God came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, O sovereign God, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household in my household will be my heir. God spoke to Abraham in a vision. And this is the first time in the Bible that God says, Fear not. I've got nothing to fear. But what was the fear that had grasped a hold of Abraham in the first place? Now, maybe the fear that he had, and I'm pretty sure it was the fear that he had, was that he's 85 years old and that there is no baby in sight. There's no offspring. There's nobody to come and take his place. And that's a big deal for Abraham in his time, in his culture, in his context. Not to have an offspring or someone there in your old age was devastating. It was more than anybody would want to have. And listen, Abraham had a lot. He had a tremendous amount of of material things. He had servants. He had mules, donkeys. He had it all. But what he didn't have is a son. And so he tells God, Listen, the one thing I want, I know you've got a lot for me, but the one thing I really, really want is to have this son. You know, 10 years earlier, 
Abraham was made a promise. Yeah, he had left his country. He left his home, he left his family, he left his comfortable surroundings, and he made this journey. And when he got to the new land, God said, guess what? I am going to give you more descendants than there is dust on the earth, more descendants than there is dust in my office, which is a lot. So I'm telling you, he had a promise that was inspirational, inspiring, but now it's 10 years later and there is no son. Nothing, not a yet, no son. And that's really shaking the relationship that Abraham was with God, it's a new one, it's a blossoming one, but it, all of a sudden, it's shaken. And he's wondering what's going to happen. Well, that feeling of disappointment of not having a child, and I've got four of them, I don't get it. I, I, I understand other people have gone through some tremendous turmoil in their lives, and you would understand that, what Abraham is going through. But maybe it's something that I get or would understand is of all of a sudden, the promises that God has made me found out that they weren't true. God backed out on them. But they were lies. For example, in the, the book of John, 1 John, verse one, chapter 1, verse 9, there's a promise that says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that is a promise. What would happen to your faith, though? I know what would happen to my faith. If God took away that promise that I could confess my sins and that he would forgive me, my world would shatter. Because I want you to think about this for just a minute. Think about something that's happened in your life, something that's been really devastating, something that you did, a mistake you made, some unfortunate situation you got yourself into, and all of a sudden you would have to carry the burden of that mistake for the rest of your life, you'd have to suffer with it and you'd have to die with it. It would eat away at your soul your entire life if that wasn't true. You know how devastating that would be to your peace of mind, to your happiness, to your inspiration to get up in the morning? You know, I had a woman come visit me a number of years ago that carried a burden, a really heavy, heavy burden. And she came to me with such a heavy heart. And I could see her, her body language was so profoundly wounded, you could just see that this burden was more than she could handle. And I asked her, have you given this to God? Have you confessed to Jesus what's happened? Because if you do, he will take this from you. And she thought about it for a minute. She let it settle in and let it sink in what I said, that if she could give it to Jesus, that burden, her life would be different. She'd be made into a new person. In fact, God will not only take that burden, He will not let us be defined by those mistakes. He will actually take that burden and refine us. He will make us and shape us into the person that God wants us to be. And when it finally sank in, you could see the burden was literally lifted. Her face lit up and she began, the tears flowed, but she, was, she knew she was finally free from that burden. Can you imagine, though, if that opportunity wasn't available? What if? Now, Jesus wants us to grow as people. He wants us to thrive. But we've got to believe in these promises for that to happen. How about another one? What would happen in Philippians, if Philippians 4, 7, the, the, the scripture that says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My life would be a wreck if I couldn't find the peace of God through that scripture that's offered to me. I'm telling you, I would be the most anxious, fearful person that walked on the planet of the earth if I did not have the foundation of peace that comes from my relationship with Jesus. If that wasn't true, my life would be a living hell. I'm telling you right now. I depend on God's peace to keep me calmed down, to keep me sane and civil. I need these promises to be true. You need them to be true. We all do. Now, there are a lot of promises made in the Bible. There are maybe hundreds of promises made in the Bible, and every single one of those is absolutely, undeniably true. But not every one of them is for you. Some promises are, in general, for everybody. Here's one that's for everybody, right? John, uh, well, actually, some are for everybody, but some contain scriptures that are specifically promised to one person or a group of people, like this example from John 16, 23. It says, in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. 
And I know some people, when they hear this scripture, they only hear the part that says, oh, I can have whatever I want. They got in their minds that God is this vending machine that I've heard Gloria talk about on occasion. She says, yeah, God's not this vending machine where you can use Jesus as the currency to plug him in and then you pull the button for whatever it is that you want in life. But that's what people hear. They don't realize that this scripture, if you back up and look at the scripture a little bit earlier, that Jesus is speaking to disciples and he's talking about a specific time frame in that day. Not every scripture, not every promise is meant for you. But listen to this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture, though, is God-breathed. Everything is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us in righteousness. So you can always get something out of anything that's been written in the Bible. Absolutely. It's intended for us to learn and grow. But not necessarily. A promise isn't necessarily your promise. I want you to hold on to that and keep that in mind. Because as we discover, Abraham's promise is very specific to him. Very specific, very clear. And, but Abraham is now wondering, yeah, I know this is the promise you made me, God. Thank you. Appreciate it. But when, that's the key word here, when is it going to come to fruition? When's it going to become real in my life? The clock is ticking. He's 80. Did you know he's 85 years old at this time? Abraham is 85 years old when God comes back to him again, and he speaks to him. And he says this in this vision. This is God's word. He says, there's going to be a day that I am going to give you a son in your flesh and blood. And verse 5 says, he took him outside and said, look up out the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. So if I heard this and understood this scripture correctly, what he's telling us is is God takes Abraham on sight, and it's like he puts his arm around him and says, listen, it's going to be okay, Abraham. Look up. A lot of stars up there. There's billions of stars up there. Abraham, you can't begin to count them, but I want you to know, but that's the kind of numbers we're talking about in terms of what your descendants will look like. It's so large. It's so unimaginable. And all of a sudden, we have this shift in Abraham. He goes from a person that's got some real doubts about what's happening, because you might recall he's gone from a point of saying, God, uh, I, the only thing I really want is a son. I know you made me a promise. I want that. In fact, the line, the line he says is, O sovereign, o sovereign Lord, what can give, you give me? He's, he's changed his position. What can you give me to Lord? I believe you. What happened? How did he transform from one position to the next instantaneously? Now, to understand this transformation, we have to really shift our thinking about how this story has been unfolding. We've been learning about Abraham, father of our faith. But you know what we're really learning about here? We're learning about God, what we need to know about God, what God wants us to know about God. Because the more we know about God, the more we grow. And the more we grow, the more we have an opportunity to have our faith grow. So we're learning about God here. And when we start looking at this story from that perspective, it begins to change our viewpoint. Now, you know what happened to Abraham here, though? He is the first person, it's recorded, that he is the first person in the history of the world to have faith in God. He's the first guy. And it's interesting how he comes to his faith. Because it's the same way all of us come to our faith. You know, we think that often that if we are good people, we're going to get more faith or have faith, right? And when sometimes we believe that if, uh, you know, we do good things for other people and we, and we work hard at what we're doing, and especially if it's helping other people, good things are going to happen to us and our faith will happen. But that's really not the way it works. There's a really, really brilliant Old Testament scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann. And he wrote this as an explanation of what happened to Abraham. He said, Abraham did not move from protest to confession by knowledge or persuasion but the, by the power of God who reveals and causes his revelation to be accepted. Abraham went from being a man who probably worshipped many gods. That was the norm. 
Everybody had a personal God. You had a family God. You had a, a God that over, overlooked the city or your community, your country, your environment, whatever it is. They had a lot of personal gods. But all of a sudden, he's transformed from a person of many gods to one that's now focusing in on the one true God. He's the first man of faith, and it wasn't really his idea. There's another pastor that says it very beautiful, John Claypool. And he had a moment of clarity in his own faith, and he wrote these words. Faith is not believing in the unbelievable, nor is it committing intellectual suicide and taking a leap in the dark. But faith is a response on our part to the inthrust of God. Doesn't that sound familiar to everybody uh, that's done any Bible studies with me in particular? Because we talk about how God has this supernatural, all-encompassing power called provenient grace that works on us. And we are witnessing grace in action in this particular case when we look at what happened to Abraham. Same thing that's happening to you. Faith is given to us. God's been working on you. He's been opening your heart. And slowly but surely, and one day you say, I want it, and bam, there is your faith. It's given to you. There's a big thinker, a theologian by the name of Henry Nowen, Nowen who put it very simply. He, he put it in an analogy. Little story. He was talking to the a leader of a, a German trapeze troupe, acrobatic troupe, and uh, after they did this amazing feats of flying through the air so beautifully and gracefully, he, he decided he wanted to speak to the leader and said, "How do you guys do it? How do you make it look so easy?" And the leader of the troupe said, "Well, it's really important that I just simply let go and let the catcher catch." In fact, if I start to try to find the catcher, if I try to reach out for the catcher and grab a hold of him, we could have a real disaster. But if I just let go, he'll catch me. And that's a pretty good analogy of our understanding how God's working in our lives. If we just let God grab a hold of us, if we open our hearts and trust in him and say, grab a hold of me, God, it's going to work out. It's kind of like love. Can't plan for it. Can't force it to happen. But when it does, you know it's there. And it feels really, really good. So we've answered the question, what happened to Abraham to get him to go from a doubter to a believer? But I really haven't tackled the question that's been on my mind. It, it always is on my mind, actually. Yeah, but when? And I know, it's, I know that that has got to be something we all think about because in our own lives we have that same question. When, God, is my healing going to come? When, God, is the job I'm looking for going to happen? When, God, is my relationship finally going to improve? When is the outlook of my future going to be shaped in a way that gets me excited about getting up for tomorrow morning? When is it going to happen, God? When? We all have that question. When? Did you know... It was 15 more years before God would answer that question. 15 more years. He was 85. 15 plus 85 is 100. He was 100 years old when God finally gave him the child that he had wanted so desperately. And Sarah was 90. And there's something in that lesson for us. Because, you know, the, the way it went down is about a year after God made him this promise in, in chapter six, in chapter 15, in verses 1 through 6, he said, you know, you're going to have those descendants. Just hang in there, buddy. About a year later, Sarah gets tired of waiting. I guess Abraham must have shared, shared the secret of what was going to happen, right? It's, it's coming. She got tired of waiting. And she says, well, you know what? I'm going to take the initiative here. And she goes to Abraham with an idea. She says, you know what? Let's quit waiting on this. You're old. I'm old. This is not going to happen. Let's get Hagar to be your wife or your surrogate. And you have the baby with her. Now, listen, I could have a really, really bad day. I could have my ears closed, my eyes shut, and I could still see that this is going to be a major problem. You don't bring in a younger servant and expect things to work out in the family. And sure enough, it fails. The whole situation is ruinous, just like it is when Abraham had in his mind, I'm going to go down to Egypt and solve my problems when there was a famine in the land. The same thing happens over and over again. So what's the lesson for us there? When we start to take things in our hands and we stop believing that God is going to catch us, that he's going to help us, that he's there for us, that his promises are true, when we start doing it on our own, we begin to sabotage our relationship with the Almighty. And I think God intentionally 
just to show Abraham that there's, some, that there's nothing that is impossible for God. I said, you know, you don't think I can give it to you when you're 85? I bet I can do it when you're 100. And gave him a child, and he did. You don't know God's plan. He's got one for you. But you know what? It's God's plan for you. And you and I don't know what his plan is. But if we're faithful, if we start to have that faith like Abraham found finally, to believe and accept and to trust, then yes, you too can fly. You too can soar. You too can experience life the way God wants you to. But you have to have that faith. You know, I guess the problem is, is timing. You know, it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, When the Lord, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some people understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Scripture tells us that if we're patient, we do our job. We do what we can to continue to grow as individuals, as human beings. And yeah, that does mean doing Bible studies and prayer time and worship and, 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 and being in fellowship and, and serving others. If we do all that, yeah, good things are going to happen to us. But at the end of the day, it's God who blesses us. And we need to hold on to that. It's in God's hands. So no matter what's happening to you right now, I know you might be feeling a little impatient. I know that the stresses may be amazing and immense right now in your life. God's got a plan. You hang in there because God loves you and he wants to see you transform and bloom into a person that finds his peace that he promises us because there's an eternity for us. There's a happy ending that's guaranteed and it is true. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for the day you've given us. God, you're an amazing God. And a lot of us forget the kind of power that you have to make things different. We see you as small sometimes when you are unmeasurable. We see you as limited when you are limitless. We see you sometimes, God, as, as finite when you are infinity. You can do anything you want. And we're so thankful, Lord, that you would take us, sinners, broken people, wounded people, and reshape us into a new creation that blossoms and flourishes in this world now and forever in eternity. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week, and we can't wait to see everybody again next week. Hey, if you haven't gone to that uh, clip yet, I wanted to let people know that starting September 6th, Sunday, September 6th, we're going to bring back people here early in the morning for a worship service, kind of old school. Just not going to have any singing because that's still out of the realm of wise behavior at this point. But on September 6th, starting at 8.30, we're going to have a service that's going to have the Word, and we're going to have Scripture, of course, and we're going to have some readings, some of the things that you're maybe really familiar with. And I want to invite you to come and join us starting, what day? September 6th be our chance to get back into the groove of being together and god bless you and have a wonderful week take care hey thanks for joining us today we hope you enjoyed today's service don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that little bell so you receive notifications to join us also if you've made a commitment to christ today or would like to we would love to pray with you and for you would you email us at rachel r-a-c-h-e-l at miami lakes umc.net and finally, we want to thank our supporters that give so that we can reach the community in practical needs as well as spiritual needs. God bless you and have an amazing day.